Hi folks, well here we are again. It's been a while, I know, but that's just the way it goes. Um, today I want to show you this four-year-old bay gilding. And of course you know Hansom. We got Hansom in the western bit now. And um, I want to I'll touch on that also, the bit and how it works and everything else. But the point is I just want to rope this little bay horse and show you that it would make a great project for somebody that wants a horse that's not going to slap you on top of the head. So he's got the mindset I'm looking for. The way it works out for me is that you see my hand on top of the saddle horn. Well, it's the same position for me for roping. It's, but it's just forward because I have to have room to dally. All right, so if you watch this horse, I'll make a circle and just watch how he bridles up. And my hand stays the same as the horn. And I can get to the horn, I can do whatever it is I want to do. Now I'm going to make a circle, and I'll show you what happens if you ride with your hand too high and make contact in the western bit on a horse at this position. What I've done is raise his head up more than I want. So when I get back down where I belong, he's able to manipulate his body more efficiently with my hand lower. It's a subtle difference, but it's the difference between a good ride and, not, and a not good ride on this horse at this point. And anybody that's a hand would figure that out really quick using him. Anyway, you've watched enough of my videos now to know that the, the foundation is what really matters. And I'm not going to elaborate on what I'm throwing and why I'm throwing it, because you can watch and see. What I would like you to notice is just, uh, I'll make a statement to you that I made in Wairika last week at a roping clinic. And good roping isn't about your right hand if you're right handed, it's about your left hand, how well you can handle your horse. Most people forget about their left hand when they're roping and the horse suffers the consequences. Now I'm just going to rope this horse and I want to share with you, I had a man get a hold of me that's in the southwest and the problem he has is not unique. I'll go ahead and be Captain Obvious. He said it's really hot where he lives right now and he was curious about how, you know, what the effect on the cattle, the heat on the cattle out on the range, what the effect it has on them. So I'll share with you what I call proactive. In other words, you can kick dirt and whine about the heat or you can do something about it. And there's ranches. I give you an example. When I worked in Montana on the Little Horn, on this, anybody that knows the Little Horn knows where Sand Creek is. That's a little over 60,000 acre pasture with a 2,000 acre beef trap. And in August, what we did when we ran steers, typical shipping time is September, October. Well, in August, the water turns black and the dirt tanks, as you call them in Arizona, and reservoirs, ponds, whatever you want to call them, because there's no running water in and out, they, they go black, so the water's no good. So, in the ranching world, 
the cheapest feed you'll ever buy is water. Okay, in the summertime, if you have cool water, it's really nice. In the wintertime, if you have unchilled water, it's really nice. What I'm getting at is that what we did was we had a roundup in August and we shipped 10% of the cattle. And what that means is we took the top end off. The heaviest cattle got shipped. And that way we cut our numbers down by 10% which left us about 5, 5,500 head left to go in, in the fall. It also allowed us to have a better inventory of feed. So the point is, is shipping early your 10% of your heavy end on the steer outfit is one of the things you can do to be proactive. Okay, on a cow-calf outfit, the biggest mistake I see made, especially in the southwest, because the weather's typically nice, is people calving year-round. So if you have a calf today at 100 degrees plus, it's not real conducive to a cow having a really great bag and everything being nice. The heat is stressful just as bad as 40 below is. So what my point is, is if you have a 90 day cabin season, for example, then you're going to be able to manage your cattle better for heat because you can dictate when they're going to be calving their calves, which would be in the just prior to the peak of the grass and not in the dead heat of the summer because you, when the calf's ready to wean you're going to have about half the weight that you would have had if you'd have calved when the grass was there. Okay, I know there's the monsoon, there's all kinds of variables, but I'm just, I'm just talking here. So what my point on a cow-calf situation is, is to wean early. So if you typically go eight months before you wean, then in, when you're in a borderline drought situation with high heat, just wean early, five or six months. Because I'll guarantee you, according to the lactation and the feed, you're not gaining anyway with the heat. So weaning early means you're going to kick out a five weight normally, and now you would kick out a four weight. Okay, so the good news for the cow is that she's no longer having to lactate for that calf. So she's going to be in better condition for the next calf for the next season. What I'm telling you is, is to manage around the stress of the animal, the factory and the calf. Okay, on heifers, first calf heifers, it may sound radical to you, but I've done it and it worked really well, is to have your heifer pairs running in a piece of country, not with the cow herd, and wean them at 110 days, which is three months. And what you'll find is you'll get a higher percentage breed back as three-year-olds. And all this stuff takes some manual labor involved. Well, okay, on a big outfit, in this weather, if you get out there and you got to gather a piece of country and then a piece of country then a piece of country, the way I would do it is I'd take my bedroll because I don't have to be in my house every night and I just stay in the brush and you get up at dark, you catch them in bed, you get them peeled off or whatever you're going to do, by 11 o'clock you're done, shade up until the evening then make another circle and get ready to peel them off. There's a system to it. But the point is, Equipment, men, horses, everything else. Take your time. In other words, it's okay if you shade up when it's hot, but you don't have to be in your house under a cooler. You can be laying out in the shade in the brush. And um, there again, it's pretty much horseback. But these are things that you can be proactive for this hot weather, and that's get them calves off them cows earlier. Okay, so now what do you do with the calves? You've got the option of shipping them green, as of today, they're worth a lot of money. So a guy can get away with them still balling when they get to the sale barn and still get a lot of money for them. Okay, that's one choice. Another one is, is you get the ball out of them three days and wait till they quit balling, then background them, which means vaccinate them. Now you've got them around headquarters, so you got some cow hay. And the most important part is a lick 
a supplement that will help them maintain some kind of weight until you can ship them. Okay, all that's math that you have to decide for yourself. But what my point is, is that there's options that you have during this kind of weather. So I want to thank the guy for sending me the email. But the fact is, you got to know where you're living and what's going on. And when there is some, when you when you know where you are, you know your conditions, water, temperature, forage. Then you sit down at the kitchen table and make a plan. Don't just whine about the heat. Do something about it. And there's there are choices. So. I just wanted to share that with you. What cattle do is they'll get up in a saddle. A saddle is a dip in the mountain range and they'll set up there because that's where the breeze comes through. Well, that's where you want to put your licks because you'll, it'll be, when they lay down up there, they're getting away from the flies and they're cooling off a little bit. So yeah, picking the place and the pasture. And I'll tell you a real radical one. That it only works if everybody wants to do it. In this kind of weather, the feed gets cooked really fast, okay? Just something I'm gonna drop, drop a dime about, and that's combined herds. In other words, if you co-op with neighbors and everybody moves their cattle around three different ranches and you have them all in one herd, you're gonna have a bank roll of extra feed if you'll do it. That's just something to think about. Well, you know how it is. Never miss. Now, the reason I like roping a horse by the front feet is because I'm going to break him to hobble. And once they understand the concept of pressure and release on the front foot, then I can hobble them. He's about to hit pressure. That's pressure. Watch, there's the release. Pressure. 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 Release. Now what I want you to notice, he's not going berserk and running around the krill trying to jump out. He's just trying to figure this out. The horse I'm sitting on is going to draw him. So those of you that say you, you don't have a rope horse, well, it ain't my fault or my feet are off the ground. You can do this on foot. You don't have to be Will Rogers. Just put Mr. Rope on Mr. Foot and start leading him. I just happen to like to work two horses at once. Now this horse, this little bay horse here, some of you will see the video of him roping cattle, which is fine. And I'm glad, you know, he, he's good about it. He doesn't have a problem at all. But the problem is, excuse me, yes, he does have a problem. What I'm getting at is that he was used to tie off on cattle, which is fine. But I want to go back to the foundation and get A, B, and C correct, knowing already to know that he can rope. But I wanted to get him good about groundwork and everything else, which is what I'll be doing with this horse. Now, once again, please be aware that I'm doing this colt. I'm watching it. My focus is on my left hand. How well can I release and ride my horse in a bridle and not be pulling on my horse's head? All this other stuff is a given. So don't lose track of what your left hand's doing. Now this is a high port bit with a cricket. It's a western bit. It's got a sanuses and a cheek. The reason for the cheek is so that a horse will break at the withers. 99% of all the horses I work with that are especially the Amarillo Quarter Horse horses. They, uh, thank you. That's how you train a horse, folks. they will take the rope off the front foot for you and then you just put it on the hind foot. It takes years to get this down. Yeah, 
Anyway, this is the western bit so that all these friends of mine that have been riding in a snaffle bit and want to transition to a western one. And of course I ruined the market on the slicer bit. Well, here's the alternative. That's what we're getting set up for. Now watch me stop this horse. And here's something everybody forgets. Watch what I do. This can be done at 30 miles an hour if you need to. Now for those of you that rope feet, if you'll notice the bite is on the hondu. If I turn the horse the other way, it takes the bite off the hondu and the rope will open up quicker. Now watch the rope. Just remember that little deal there and save you hours of standing there and watching it. But handsome here, as you, if, as you probably figured out, we're going to start showing more videos of the horses that are for sale. So if you're interested, all you got to do is give us a call. And we have to have this interview. And I, I hate to put it that way, but it's a fact. I got to talk to you. I got to know where you live and what you want a horse for. And then I can help you decide. And a lot of people, I just say, there's no way in hell you're getting this horse because it won't work for what you're wanting. In other words, handsome here. I don't think I'd pick him for the keyhole race. He would be out one side than the other, if you, those of you that know what that means. He's not a fast horse, but what he is getting, for those of you that have watched him over the last eight months, he's got a really nice mind. He's real good to be around. So, and the one behind me, like I said, is a project. The word project means it's four, okay? I don't care how handy it is, it's a project. I can't make them any older. So, there you go. This is Mutt and Jeff. I think you can tell them apart. Pretty easy. Can you just touch on, like, a person has to, I've had a lot of people say, well, I can't rope from the ground because I don't have the strength. Well, if you're standing in the middle of the of a 45-foot round pen with a 40-foot rope, or a 60-foot rope, there there isn't any strength involved, is there? I mean, no, there's not. In fact, um, I'm going to give my horse to my prairie pal and show you. Now, for those of you that aren't fortunate enough to own a horse you can actually rope off of, and you're worried about getting jerked out of your socks, here's how you do it. Never ever get straight in line with the spine. That's called a tug of war. Horse weighs a lot, you don't weigh a lot. So you always get at an angle and put pressure on the rope. When the horse gives, you let go. If the horse goes running backwards and you smell burning flesh, you forgot to let go. Okay. Now what about if the horse is running around the round pin? If a horse is running around the round pin because you didn't do anything productive prior to roping them, cut the pin in half. Keep stepping in front of them, they'll go back the other way. Keep stepping in front of them, they'll go back the other way. The odds of this horse running around the round pin are pretty slim. That's thus the project. So now I'm going to watch the shadow. I already know the horse is coming with me. I'm going to watch the horse. Okay, that foot's over. It's done. Don't worry about it. So, if you have any Irish jeans in you at all, and you get a horse to come with you. You might catch a hind foot. But not today. 
It's the we people. All right, if you have a horse that's not gentle, you hold Mr. Lead Rope and you take Mr. Rope and throw it over him. That's how it starts. As he goes around you, you just keep letting him go around you without getting tangled up in the rope and keep throwing the end of the rope or the lead rope if you're not multitasker. Anyway, I have no idea what we've done today other than to share with you. Have a nice day. Bye. All right, you're supposed to remind me to hobble him. Oh, would you hobble him? Okay, folks, now, I've roped this colt's feet, and I'm going to hobble him for the first time. I know he hasn't been broke to hobble, but a lot of horses we get out of Mexico, they've been broke to single hobble. In other words, they'll tie a rope around their front foot and tie them to the bottom of a pole and let them graze. So they drag a rope around ever since they're weaned. And I'm guessing he was one of those that you could just tie him and he'd be fine. But to, to hobble a horse, 1995 of course for the hobbles. When you first do it, you want the feet to be as close as you can together. And please remember that this is a very quick process. Never stand in front of them. See how I've got the rope? All right, he just tested it. He feels the pressure. He moved his left front foot. So now I take him off. That's the release. Now, Hang on a second, and I'll show you the end of the result. Gate me, will you? Okay. Now. Handsome here has figured it out because I've been hobbling, hobbling him for probably nine months. And he knows he knows that when he's hobbled he's off. So he can relax and I've got to a point where I can be farther away from him. When I teach a horse to hobble like the bay horse here, I'll be staying next to it. I'm not going to hobble it and go to the house. But him, I've been working on distancing, and he still stands. And a lot of people ask me about ground tying. Well, I did a clinic in Wairika last week, I guess it was, and I had to get on and off a lot. So I didn't have, I didn't have my hobbles with me. I just dropped the reins and go fix whatever it was I was fixing, and he stood there, okay? That's ground time. However, please understand, I was in an arena. On the dirt. If he took off, I was able to catch him, but you don't do this out in the middle of nowhere. So. And for our people who live where there's a lot of grass, you wouldn't do it either, right? You can't do it where there's grass. I don't want my horses to move when I hobble them. Well, if I hobble them like that on green grass, they're gonna move. So that's not how I, Hobbling to me means they don't go. The other type of hobbling is what you do in hunting camp or something like that and horses can walk and graze. Another advantage you guys to having a horse that you can rope off of, if you'll notice Junior here is drawn to this horse. Okay, so psychologically, you're gonna cut a lot of your time in half by having another horse in the corral for this particular chapter. Not all chapters. It's just something to think about. So, there you go. Thank you.